Hello friends, I think it's time for more Xenoblade videos and this time I want to talk about the topic that not many people addressed at all. Ever since Xenoblade 3 dropped, we actually got a lot of new information about the lore of past games as well. For example, we've gotten confirmation of two titan names that we didn't know before. In Xenoblade 2, the people of all rest refer to the titans as the nations they are carrying. An example for this is Tantel, as everyone outside of the royal family refers to it as Tantel. But thanks to Pandoria who can directly communicate with the titan, we know its actual name to be Genbu. Genbu is only one of two titans that can communicate with people. Genbu needs Pandoria as an interpreter, but then there's also Gramps that learned how to speak the human language because he fell in love with a human. His actual name is Azurda or Seryu in the Japanese version. But all the other titans can't actually speak to us or any blade we encountered. So the group and every other person calls them by their nations like Gormod, Uraya, Moadain and so forth. Well Xenoblade 3 gave us answers for two other titans we encountered in Xenoblade 2, Gormod and Uraya. Gormod is pretty straightforward and has location names in both Xenoblade 2 and Xenoblade 3 named after it, Melnath. But more interestingly, a location in Xenoblade 3 confirms that Uraya's titan name is actually Cebu. The fact that both Uraya and Tantel have similar titan types was already hinted at in Xenoblade 2, but only thanks to Xenoblade 3 we finally got the name revealed. I love these minuscule little details that 90% of people won't ever think about or even question, but expand the world and makes them feel so much more alive. So let's tackle today's actual topic. Where did the horny people come from? Uh, I mean, where did the horned race from Xenoblade 3 that Fiona and many other NPCs are part of come from? We never saw any horned people in Xenoblade 2, or did we? Before we really jump into things here, just a quick reminder that this is a very new and small channel, so if you want me to continue doing videos, I would really appreciate if you would leave a like and subscribe. Thanks. Okay, let's clear up the important facts first. Xenoblade 3 combines the worlds of Xenoblade 1 and 2 in an interesting way. Because of the two worlds trying to reunite, Origin had to be made. This device saves every former location and life form into a database to reboot the world after its annihilation. Zed abuses Origin's power and recreates former people of all rest and by honest into soldiers that all have their memories wiped. So basically, every soldier we see in Xenoblade 3 is a previous resident of Allrest or Bionis. For the Xenoblade 1 side, they form the Kvesi army with Homs, Hyantia and Machina. But Xenoblade 2 had already way more diverse races, so they formed the Agnes army with humans from many different titans, Urians, Indoline, Gormoti and also haunt people that we don't know the name of and haven't even seen in Xenoblade 2. Well, actually we kinda did, let's talk about it. All rest, a wide seemingly endless sea of clouds, at its heart the world tree piercing the heavens. Around the world tree are titans circling the cloud sea forming the ground beneath our feet. These titans evolve from minuscule life forms to the giants we see them today. Through countless of generations, these titans gave birth to new life that over time evolved into a new breed of mankind. These people would vary from titan to titan. The Gormoti would evolve into people with cat-like features. The Orion people evolved into people with tough scales. Indoline would live for a long time and Moadanians would evolve into Scottish people with poor taste buds. Don't you worry. Have some faith in my taste buds. You get the idea. Most races would simply look like humans look today though. The people of Moadain, Torna and Letheria for example don't have any unique physical features. But what is important to understand is that a blade is massively influenced by the first driver that awakens them. Pyra and Nier explain this at the beginning of the game and it is also brought up later on in NPC dialogue. We can see this in the main game, especially with Malos, who was tainted by Amalthus' worldviews. 
but the driver does not only influence their personality, they also heavily influence the appearance of their blade. Nia closely resembles her sister because her driver thought about his daughter at the time and Wolfric looking like a spider beast is because he was awakened by an arachno. Even if all blades look way more extraordinary and have crazy looking features, some do resemble their driver's race if you pay attention. Finch is a Turkan blade, Boreas is a Nopon blade and Sua resembles someone from the Igna race. Because blade designs are so extra, we can't actually know if every blade resembles a former race of all rest, but with Xenoblade 3, we actually know of a few blades who definitely do. Let me introduce you to Electra, a very human looking blade with horns. And let's throw in Korra as well. And maybe this is too much, but Zenobia also has horn looking things. I mean, Electra resembles Fiona especially well. There's no doubt for me, Electra and Korra are definitely a result of their drivers being from this fabled horned tribe that we will just call Orni race from now, okay? Now an important point I need to address. Most, if not all NPCs that have horns in Xenoblade 3 are actually blades themselves. I've walked through every Agnes colony to record some NPC footage and even if I couldn't locate their core crystals, they all have ether lines running through their whole bodies. Actually, if you never noticed it, every single Agnes member either is a blade or is a flesh slash blade eater. It's hard to tell on normal NPCs because their body is always covered completely, but in special cases like Tyon, Teach and Juniper, you can clearly see that they have a core crystal implanted. My guess is that Zed probably only recreated people from all rest that have a blade connection because of their inherited strength that would help them keep up in a war with Kevesi that all have a power frame. But this could also just be origin shenanigans. But it's important to understand that having horns is not standard for blades and I also don't think every blade evolves into having horns in this short time frame before Xenoblade 3 starts. Also Senna disproves that. What is more reasonable is that the only race from Xenoblade 2 just had a lot of blades that resembled them or they became flesh eaters. Another special case for the Oni people is actually Nimue. She only has one horn but has way more striking blade properties like ice hands and feet. She does resemble theory in that regard. But more importantly there's Fiona. As I said, she not only resembles Electra the closest with her short red horns, she also doesn't have any visible blade features, no ether lines and no crazy ice powers. I'm not saying she has no blade connections. What I'm saying is that she is probably one of the rare cases of being a blade eater. Blade eaters are humans that took a core crystal and became part blade, like Zeke and Tyon. This doesn't change their human appearance, it only gives them immortality and awesome powers. Which means that her horns are actually hers and she is an original human from the Oni race. But wait. How is this possible? We didn't see any Oni looking driver in the main game or Torna. So here's the thing, we didn't get to see all the titans in Xenoblade 2. We know of the main titans we visited during the game, but there are actually more. Did you know that next to Argentum, there are actually 10 other trade guilds? Anopon mentions that there are 11 of them. We learn of two other guilds, namely Voltus and Petherium Trade Guild from this Nopon and even more in side quests and stuff. These are of course small titans that carry the trade guilds with mostly Nopon around and don't have their own population, but this shows that we never visited all the titans in the game. Here is a map of all rest that we got during Torna the Golden Country. We can count up to 10 unnamed titans plus the 5 that are specifically name dropped here. One of the unnamed titans has to be Uriah, one Temperantia and the Lutheran Archipelago is also not specifically mentioned here. And then we know of two other named titans that we never visited, Spezia and Estum. But this was 500 years ago. How many survived till the main game? Well we know about one that for sure didn't. RIP. But I actually meant the nation of Sia that was also destroyed during the Aegis War and even before Torna sank. 
actually three titans fell during the Aegis War, but they never mentioned which titan was the third. Temperentia survived till the main game, but the nation was completely eradicated. And even though we do not know if Specia sunk or not, it was the place that fell at the credits of Torna when Amalthus attacked the surviving Torna people and killed Laura. That would leave us with like 10 titans that still could be alive with their nations intact. Now if we ignore Gormod, Uriah, Moadain, Lefteria, Tantal and Indol, it only leaves 4 titans that are not accounted for, with one of them presumably being Astum, which is Mikael's home titan by the by. And even though Mikael does have horny energy, he doesn't actually have horns so we can count this one out as well. Ah uh, yes, and unfortunately one other titan dies right in front of us during the opening cutscene of Xenoblade 2. Honestly, long story short, there could be way more titans that were never drawn on the map, but even if you only count the confirmed titans, there are still two possible titans left that could have had the Oni people and that we never went to and didn't get involved in the main story at all. And if there are really only two left that we never saw, it could also explain the ice scale looking blades that are also NPCs in Xenoblade 3. You know who they resemble really really closely? Godfrey. And there it is, I solved the puzzle. Do you think I nailed it? Let me know in the comments. I love digging deep into these small details, so if you found some other hints Xenoblade 3 left in plain sight, please also write these down in the comments below. And thank you so much for watching. Never forget to like and subscribe. Don't do it for me, do it for Nia.